melatonin is confusing. It's a supplement and you don't really want to be dependent on a supplement, especially with something as natural as sleep, right? So I want to break down a lot of the literature and I wanted to do this video because it's sort of a personal thing for me because when I was really overweight, when I was like 300 pounds and honestly until I got down to like 210 pounds, sleep was a very, very big problem for me. Now I spent a lot of my time inside, I spent a lot of my time in front of a computer and it was just one of many things that made my life candidly miserable, but not being able to sleep, the one time that I thought that I could escape a lot of the stresses of my life and a lot of the just things I didn't want to deal with, I didn't even have that. So I leaned on melatonin quite a bit and then I started to get concerned like, well, am I using it too much? What's going on? So anyhow, a couple of years ago, I did a video talking about melatonin supplementation and I expressed concern over just the things I'm talking about. If you take a supplement for long enough, like melatonin, are you going to create what's called a negative feedback loop where you no longer produce it naturally? And there's a lot of merit to that because we naturally produce about a quarter milligram of melatonin per day, you know, when it's time to go to bed or when it gets dark out. And most melatonin supplements, you're looking anywhere from one to 10 milligrams. That's a huge difference. So it seems like you could just like burn out that receptor and create a negative feedback loop pretty quick. But since then, there's been some interesting data that's come out. In fact, the first systematic review and meta-analyses has come out surrounding melatonin supplementation in terms of safety and efficacy. So it was published in the journal of Complementary Therapies in Medicine, okay? And it was very interesting because it took a look at 50 studies, 50 pretty large studies, and 26 of them ended up showing no adverse effects, no negative outcomes from melatonin supplementation. However, 24 of them did show at least one adverse outcome. However, most of these adverse outcomes were very short term, nothing standing out as extraordinarily long term. But additionally, what they found with this is that these issues could be mitigated, these adverse events could be mitigated by supplementing melatonin along with your natural circadian rhythms. So in other words, don't take melatonin when it's dark out right before you go to bed, take melatonin right when it's getting dark so you're matching your diurnal rhythms and use melatonin to kind of get your body into a natural sleep-wake cycle. Then there was a 2019 meta-analysis published in CNS Drugs that took a look at 37 studies. And again, it generally found melatonin safe and effective. The only issues that it found were pretty short-term effects, like short-term negative effects. So the next day, people were maybe a little sleepy or they had some dizziness or they had headaches. And even that was pretty small amounts. So it's kind of interesting. Do I need to eat my words on melatonin from a couple of years ago? Possibly, but I still stand behind the fact that like interventional use like just to be able to fix a problem, melatonin can work. And we should always lean into natural ways to boost our melatonin, which we're gonna talk about as this video goes on and give you some solutions there. So as far as efficacy is concerned, there was a pretty brand spanking new study in 2022 that was a meta-analysis looking at the efficacy of melatonin supplements. And this is what really sold me on the occasional like periodic use of melatonin. So this meta-analysis was published in the journal Neurology, okay? And it took a look at 23 trials and it found that between two and 10 milligrams of melatonin supplementation improved overall sleep quality and sleep duration of adults that had various diseases. Okay, now these diseases ranged from like metabolic dysfunction, anxiety, asthma, things like that, but also just good old fashioned sleep disorders, right? So there was a significant improvement there. That kind of goes without saying, but it is very, very important. If something can legitimately give you improved sleep, that is something that we need to lean on. Okay, real sleep, not just like having some alcohol and knocking yourself out. That's not real sleep. That's just being passed out. There was another 2019 meta-analysis that found that supplementing melatonin increased total sleep time by 30 minutes. Not time in bed, but actual sleep time. So we've established that melatonin is good. We're also establishing that people have lower levels of melatonin than they used to, and older people have lower levels of melatonin than younger people. So what are some ways that we can support our natural melatonin levels a little bit more, especially as we get older? The first one is actually taking care of the gut and consuming more fiber. And it sounds totally crazy until you look at a 2021 study that was published in Scientific Reports. It's really wild. What they found is that when you had more, what are called short chain fatty acids, so namely, uh, butyrate, propionate, acetate, when you had more of these what are called short chain fatty acids in the feces, there was basically poorer sleep. 
Now these short chain fatty acids, this is interesting because short chain fatty acids are a byproduct of fibers being broken down, right? They're a byproduct of fibers being broken down by bacteria that therefore produce these amazing short chain fatty acids. So if you're listening carefully, you heard that I said higher levels of short chain fatty acids were bad. Well, higher levels of short chain fatty acids in the feces are bad because what's happening there is that indicates that these short chain fatty acids are passing through the body. These amazing short chain fatty acids that we need to act upon cells, act upon receptors as a signaling device are leaving the body. We don't want that. So my reason in saying that is when you start looking at how this works, it makes sense. So when we consume fiber, it breaks down into short chain fatty acids, generally speaking. These short chain fatty acids bind to a receptor on very specific cells. These cells are called enterochromaffin cells or enterochromaffin cells, potato, potato. Okay, so when they bind to these cells, that actually produces serotonin. And you've probably heard some like weird blogs years ago. I remember when it was surfacing that we produce serotonin in the gut. Well, we produce some of our serotonin in the gut, which is interesting, and they happen as a result of these enterochromaffin cells. But these enterochromaffin cells need this light switch to get turned on, and these short-chain fatty acids are essentially the light switch. There's also some interesting evidence that it induces tryptophan hydroxylase expression, so expresses, uh, activates genes that create the enzyme that allows the conversion of tryptophan into serotonin. That's a little bit more mechanistic, and we need to see more data on that to understand more of how that works, but still very interesting. So when you look at fiber, when you look at the gut, one of the first things that comes to mind for people is going to be probiotics. Should I take a probiotic? Bottom line is eat fiber. That's gonna be the best way. But if you are looking at probiotics for overall gut diversity, I would recommend Seed. So I put a link down below for them. They are what's called a symbiotic. So that means that they have a prebiotic and a probiotic in one capsule. Really interesting technology. It's a capsule inside of a capsule. And that way you're getting the proper delivery. You're getting what you're setting out for. Because a lot of times the hydrochloric acid in your gut can really just destroy a probiotic. So Seed is a little bit different. They also put their money where their mouth is and do a lot of their own research and fund a lot of microbiome research. So that link down below will save you 15% off of the Seed Daily Symbiotic if you wanna try it out. That is personally the one that I use and I've been using it for a little over a year now and I really am a fan of it. So that link for 15% off down below. Now we have to face facts about us all getting older and some of us actually getting old, not just older. As we get older, melatonin levels tend to decline or they definitely decline. Okay, they definitely decline. But a number of other things are happening at the same time. Uh, our cells tend to get more damaged, to put it in sort of a colloquial way, right? Mitochondria becomes less efficient. Uh, basically, cells start having damaged particles leak out of them. Again, very simple way of putting it. But when that happens, the immune system has to corral those things. It has to deal with them. That triggers uh, an increase in inflammation as we get older. It's known as inflammaging. I've done topics surrounding that. Well, what's interesting is that melatonin seems to have a correlating effect with that in terms of uh, improving, right? Improving. So if melatonin levels are higher, we see a decrease in the inflammaging, this inflammation that's associated with aging. So one of the things that melatonin can do is it helps the mitochondrial efficiency. So it helps the mitochondria from an antioxidant perspective. So it protects the mitochondria a little bit more so that the mitochondria isn't leaking, again, for lack of a better term, those particles into the bloodstream. So it helps lessen the damage associated molecular patterns associated with aging. But that's a little bit gobbledygook, kind of some Greek. What else does it do? Well, melatonin also seems to suppress interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-1-8, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Sounds like more Greek. Basically, melatonin potentially modulates the inflammatory response that may happen as a result of aging too. And then lastly, melatonin also can prevent excitotoxicity in the brain. Now that means like, let's say your brain was just super amped up and you were so tilted towards what's called the glutamate scale that your brain was just firing like crazy, it was hard to fall asleep. Melatonin can neutralize some of the negative effects of that. So what are some ways that you can boost melatonin naturally aside from consuming fiber so you can get the potential longevity benefits, but you can also just flat out sleep. Okay, well first, a hot bath. Believe it or not, a hot bath works very, very, very well. There's a study that was published in the journal Sleep Medicine that found that just 10 minutes of sitting in a hot bath at 104 to 109 degrees was enough to improve sleep significantly. This improved subjective sleep quality, which always counts for something because those of you that suffer with sleep like I did, that subjective sleep quality is important 
to prevent the sleep anxiety that occurs. Oh, I'm not gonna sleep tonight. Oh, I'm not gonna sleep tonight. If you start feeling like you're sleeping better, guess what? You'll probably start sleeping better. But there is a mechanism behind this too. When you sit in a hot bath and you get out of the bath, you have a cooling effect, okay? When you're hot, a lot of the blood is going to disperse throughout your body, triggering this cooling effect. The cooling effect itself triggers the release of melatonin from the pineal gland. So this alone is going to help support melatonin production. Another one that is really interesting that whenever I talk about, I always have naysayers because it just sounds so like biohacky, but it's interesting. It's tart cherry juice. Now, tart cherry juice doesn't have a lot of carbohydrates, so you can have it on a low carb diet just in small amounts, but where's the data? Well, the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition published a paper, it took a look at people consuming tart cherry juice uh, along with a placebo or versus a placebo. From baseline, the group that had the tart cherry ended up having higher levels of melatonin, significantly higher, yet still within the natural range. So they were at the top end of the natural range. So somehow it was helping the production of melatonin or the release of melatonin. They also noticed that all the sleep parameters improved, sleep onset, their overall sleep efficiency, sleep duration, all of that improved. The downside is a lot of this is pretty observational. Like we don't really know what's going on. So we have to dig a little deeper. So there was another study. This one was published in the American Journal of Therapeutics. Now this one was cool because it used polysomnography. Now this is like the gold standard when it comes down to sleep. It's like actual sleep studies, looking at sleep waves, looking at everything. This is what you really wanna look for, not just subjective observational stuff that we see all the time. So in this case, they took placebo group versus a tart cherry juice group. And for two weeks, the tart cherry juice group consumed 240 milliliters of tart cherry juice two times per day. That's a pretty hefty amount, but still interesting data came out of this. They found in the tart cherry group, overall sleep time increased, get this, 84 minutes, almost an hour and a half more sleep time. I know it's small data, but that's a tremendous outcome that absolutely warrants more investigation, especially when you look at the other studies and you see the increases in melatonin. Something is happening there. We just don't entirely know what. One of the things that they looked at is there was an increase in what are called procyanidin levels, so uh, vitamin B2. That was increased quite significantly in the brain and they found that it had modulated inflammatory markers within the brain. So potentially there was less inflammation in the brain which may have allowed more of these sleep signals to do their job properly. They did also notice that there was more tryptophan availability. So tryptophan, amino acid, converts into serotonin with tryptophan hydroxylase, which we'll talk about in a second, which therefore turns into melatonin. So basically tryptophan to serotonin to melatonin. When more tryptophan is available, you could potentially have more of that conversion, but we only know that first step. We don't know everything else, but we can start connecting dots. Very, very interesting there. The next one is getting as much sun as you can during the day. It's not about just fatiguing yourself and getting tired. It's about as much vitamin D in a natural way as you possibly can. You can take vitamin D supplementation, but it's kind of ambiguous with the data. So there's a study that was published in PLOS1 that definitely correlated low levels of vitamin D with poor sleep, but didn't necessarily give us anything to believe when it came down to vitamin D supplementation above and beyond restoring your natural levels to where they should be, uh, improving sleep. So sleep, vitamin D deficiency affects sleep, but vitamin D supplementation above and beyond doesn't seem to improve sleep. However, there was a study published in Nutritional Neurosciences. It was a pretty small data study. This study did find that vitamin D supplementation seemed to improve some markers of sleep, but not all. And it just comes to beg the question that adequate levels of vitamin D, which can be very different for each individual, are probably important for sleep, but it's not a tool that you're going to use to get better sleep but it's something to look at. So what is the mechanism here? This is where it gets very interesting, a very interesting potential mechanism. So vitamin D binds to a response element on tryptophan hydroxylase genes. These are the genes that activate to basically allow for tryptophan hydroxylase to convert tryptophan into serotonin, which later on becomes melatonin. If you're not expressing the gene to create the enzyme, that is what's called a rate limiting step. Then you can no longer create serotonin from tryptophan. So vitamin D binds to this receptor that ultimately allows the creation or the formation or the release of these enzymes. Now we've seen in some data that vitamin D does do this. Vitamin D does tend to bind specifically to the tryptophan hydroxylase 2 uh, gene. 
So again, we have to back the data out and see, okay, this is definitely doing something, but is it the actual cause? So when you look at in vitro stuff, you see, yes, in mammalian cells, in mammalian brain cells, it's definitely having an effect. So it's one of those things in science where we look at the observational pieces, we see obviously vitamin D is important, then we start looking at some, some of these mechanistic studies, we start understanding that, and we connect the dots. But it's also common sense. We're supposed to be outside during the day, and by contrast, that would allow us to sleep a little bit better at night when the sun goes down, simply because those natural circadian rhythms and diurnal rhythms can match up. So I know this is a long-winded one, but it needed to be said because there's not a lot of content surrounding the pros and the cons of melatonin. So the short takeaway with this is, do everything you possibly can to boost your melatonin levels naturally, then look at tart cherry juice as sort of an intervention, then look at melatonin supplementation as a temporary intervention, only taking it when you're traveling and you need to reset, or taking it right when it gets dark out so you're emulating your body's natural pineal gland release of melatonin. As always, I'll see you tomorrow.